or two parameters if you include reflected light. So these are much simpler models, and it turns out they do a fine job of fitting the data. Um, and the key for the black curve is that we've accounted for reflected light. And so um, we can actually fit the, the continuum short word of the water absorption band using reflected light. Now, um, you expect to see water vapor absorption regardless of whether, whether you're seeing thermal emission or reflected light. Either way, the light has passed through the atmosphere um, and there's water vapor, so it will absorb things. So in fact, in the case of, of reflected light, the, the photons are passing through the atmosphere twice. They go down through the atmosphere and they bounce off of clouds or something and they come back up. So they've actually gotten two passes through the atmosphere. Um, so either way, you expect to see that water absorption band. Um, okay, so the point of, of Dylan's uh, study here is that reflection is actually a big deal in the near infrared. Um, and this is, this is important because a lot of us um, are interested in near infrared uh, measurements, especially with James Webb um, launching next year. And, uh, you know, and there's uh, a Montreal-based instrument near us which as the name implies is a near infrared um, spectrograph. And we would like to be able to interpret what we observe. And the key thing here is that when you're looking at secondary eclipses, you have to worry about reflected light. What you're seeing is some unholy admixture of thermal emission and reflected light from, um, from these planets. Okay. So now that was it for the eclipses. Um, and so that was all just characterizing the day sides of planets. So now I'm going to move on to phase curves. So this is going to be observations of planets throughout their orbit. And so this means we're going to be learning about not just their day sides, but also their night sides. So here's a cartoon of uh, phase curves. Um, don't be worried when the plot shows up. You're going to see very sparse data. Um, this is actually based on a, a press release for a 2006 paper, which turned out to subsequently be debunked. Um, and so the data, I can assure you the data look much, much better now. And you're going you're gonna to see some of those data uh, shortly. Okay, but the, the basic picture with phase curves is simply the planet's going around its star. When you're seeing the day side, presumably the day side is hotter. Um, and so you're going to get more thermal emission. And when you see the night side, uh, the night side is cooler and you're going to get less thermal emission. So if you do this at thermal wavelengths, um, again, not just in the near infrared, but more kind of in the mid-infrared, um, you're going to see uh, kind of these sinusoidal oscillations as the planet goes around its star. You can see a uh, hot day side, cold night side. Um, one of the cool tricks you can do if you have high uh, signal to noise phase curves is you can actually construct maps of planets. Um, and so this is this is the very first map that we made back in 2007. Um, and the the key takeaway from this map was this eastward offset that we saw. So the sun facing longitude is in the dead center of this map. And so that, that longitude in the middle always has the sun beating down on it. So it's always high noon um, at that in the center of this map. So the hottest point on the planet, it turns out, is not the point directly beneath its star. It's, it's a point you know, significantly to the east of that, so 20 or 30 degrees to the east of that. And and the question is, why is that? You know, why is the, this eastward offset? Um, so the mundane explanation is simply eastward rotation. And so that's what we see on Earth, right? So if it is noon um, in Greenwich, right? So over the Greenwich meridian, if, if the sun is, is beating down on, on, on the, the Greenwich meridian, then the, the hottest time, the hottest location on the planet is not actually at that longitude. It's gonna be eastward of there. Um, because our planet rotates to the east and our planet has a, a finite thermal inertia, right? So this is just a restatement of the, the well-known fact that it, the hottest time of day is not noon, it's in the afternoon. Um, and that's because we have a, a thermal lag. Okay, so eastward rotation is possible, except uh, the theorists assure us that these planets should be tidally locked. So they should have a permanent day side and a permanent night side. So um, so maybe there's something funny going on and we don't understand tidal locking as well as we thought we did. Um, but, but most people uh, tend to, to rule out eastward rotation because they assume that these planets are tidally locked with a permanent day sun, permanent night side. Okay, so the, the second option here, eastward winds, is the one that everyone has latched onto and that everyone believes. And the reason people believe it is basically just look at the date on that publication, the Shoman and Guillaume paper 
was made in 2002. That's five years before uh, Heather Knudsen and I made this map. And so that's actually a prediction. <laughs> and it's a prediction that, that seemingly is correct. And there are so few of those in exoplanets, we tend to really um, latch on to the few correct predictions we have. And so um, they had predicted from doing uh, general circulation models that the, the atmospheres on these tidally locked planets would actually exhibit equatorial super rotation, which in the solar system we see on Titan and on Venus. Um, and, and they predicted this from, from the physics. They said that these tidally locked planets should actually have winds blowing to the east at the equator, as opposed to Earth, let's say, where the winds blow to the west at the equator, right? We have trade winds. Um, so, so the eastward winds is probably the, the dominant hypothesis that, you know, when people look at a map like this, they just say, yep, that's because you have equatorial super rotation. Um, and they high five, you know, Adam Schoeman and Christian Guillaume. Okay, the last hypothesis here is sort of a crazy one, which could be important, which is clouds. Um, maybe what we're seeing here is not strictly due to winds blowing heat to the east. Maybe what we're seeing here is just that the western hemisphere of the planet is cloudy and therefore looks cold because you're, you know, you're essentially getting thermal emission from a high altitude cold cloud deck, whereas the eastern hemisphere is cloud free and therefore looks um, hotter because you're, you're looking deeper into the atmosphere on the eastern hemisphere. So this seemed completely crazy. Uh, and in fact, no one had even hypothesized this um, until the 2013 discovery um, by, by Demery and, and collaborators that for at least one planet, it appears that in fact, the Western hemisphere is cloudy. Okay, and this came from uh, measurements with the Kepler mission. And so these are reflected light measurements and the phase curves of that planet at reflected light looked really weird. And the only way to explain it was that the Western hemisphere of that planet was really uh, cloudy and shiny and the Eastern hemisphere was, um, was dark and cloud free. So if you take that kind of a map and you just, ex and you just think about what that would do to the outgoing long wave radiation from this planet, um, it could neatly explain these eastward offsets that we've seen. Um, and then of course, um, Ray J's student, Lisa Estevez, has, has shown that this, this weird um, albedo map is not just uh, peculiar to one planet, but actually seems to be the case you know, for a lot of planets. And so she did a statistical study of, um, of Kepler planets and showed that, yeah, you know, a lot of these planets have weird cloud formations. Okay, so those are our options. The takeaway point, though, is that, you know, it doesn't matter why we think that these planets have eastward offsets. The point is that all short period planets exhibit eastward offsets. So, so far, we've looked at 10 of them, and all 10 of them have eastward offsets, or they have no offset, right? Like the error bars are too big, and we can't tell, but, but basically, they're all either the, the wind is blowing to the east, or they're rotating to the east, or there's something about the clouds, but we always see the hottest points in these planets is always to the east of the substellar point. Okay, so now... Uh, I've kind of set this up for a weird outlier case. And so these are infrared phase curves of Coro 2b. This is yet another hot Jupiter discovered by the French satellite uh, Coho. And this is work that my uh, master student Lisa Dang has been doing. Um, and so here's the cleaned up light curves. I'm not going to scare you by showing you what raw um, Spitzer Space Telescope light curve data looks like, but, but here's what the, the, the cleaned up version looks like. And so the features you're seeing on this curve, um, the little dip all the way on the left and all the way on the right, that's the eclipse. That's when the planet passed behind its star. The big dip in the middle is the transit. That's when the planet passed in front of its star. And the interesting stuff I want to talk about today are the little wiggles going up and down. And so the bottom panel zooms into those wiggles. Um, and it turns out that the... The, those wiggles have an offset, so basically the, the brightest part on the planet is not directly facing the star, um, it's offset. Uh, so, so essentially the peak of this phase curve occurs a little bit after eclipse. So the problem is that that corresponds to a westward offset for the planet, all right? And so basically if you make a, a, a temperature map of the planet, it looks like this. The hottest part of this planet is not to the east, like on all the other planets we've looked at, it's to the west. And so what the heck is going on? Um, one possibility 
Um, and this, this was uh, kind of, a, again, in the spirit of like a prediction, this was a paper written a few years ago by Emily Rusher and Eliza Kempton. Uh, one possibility is if you have a slowly rotating planet, so a planet that is not quite tidally locked, then in certain cases, you can set up uh, just a qualitatively different circulation pattern. And in particular, you can get winds blowing to the west. So you get something that looks a lot more like Earth's trade winds, um, rather than getting the, the standard equatorial super rotation that we, that we know and love on hot Jupiters. So this is option one. Um, and in the interest of full disclosure, I've talked to Emily uh, Rauscher about this hypothesis, and she doesn't believe that this could be happening on Koro 2b. So anyhow, she's, she's gonna be a co-author on this paper, and so um, you'll have to read her discussion to find out more. Um, another possibility is those pesky clouds. So maybe, maybe some of what we're seeing on these hot Jupiter light curves really is dictated by clouds. Um, and if that's the case, you can imagine if Koro 2b has clouds um, on the Eastern hemisphere for some reason, then maybe uh, it will lead to this funny looking phase curve. Um, so essentially if the Eastern hemisphere is cloudy and the Western hemisphere is cloud free, then you're gonna get more thermal emission from the Western hemisphere and you're gonna infer this, this westward, westward um, hotspot offset. Okay, so that's it for, for studies of um, specific exoplanets. And so now, now I'm gonna do something which is kind of fun, which we can do in the exoplanet community, which is we've got lots of planets. And so, so I'm gonna start talking about just statistics. I'm just gonna to touch on it really quick, okay? And so, and, and the plots I'm gonna show are, are essentially like this one. And so I'm just gonna describe this one really quick. This is uh, WASP-12b, so it's actually the same planet I started off with um, when I was talking about uh, Taylor's results. And, and the two axes here are the bond albedo, which is just how reflective the planet is, and the heat redistribution efficiency, which is how well the planets can move energy from the day side to the night side. Um, and uh, the, the point is that if you have uh, day side measurements, you, can, you get these blue contours, and so you know that the, the planet must live somewhere in this, in this swath at one, two, and three sigma uh, confidence. And if you have full orbit phase curves, then you learn about the night side of the planet, and then you constrain the planet to live in this kind of red boomerang. And you take those two and you multiply them together, and you get the, the black contours, which are one, two, and three sigma confidence intervals. And so these, this is basically telling us something about how reflective the planet is and how well it moves heat from day to night, um, which roughly speaking has to do with radiative time scales and advective time scales in the atmosphere. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Except that we can do that for lots of planets because, because there's a lot of hot Jupiters out there and we can actually characterize a lot of them. And so this is work that, that my uh, former uh, grad student, uh, Joel Schwartz did. And, um, and so you can plot a bunch of planets and each of these planets, we can actually constrain um, its albedo, so how shiny it is and how it's moving that energy from day to night. Um, and you can see trends. So for example, one of the trends that, that this paper really nailed was this idea that as you go towards hotter and hotter planets, planets receiving more and more um, sunlight, um, they get increasingly bad at moving heat from day to night. Um, and so if you look at the colors of the ellipses here, those, are, those signify the temperatures of these planets. Um, they're a radiation temperature, which is roughly their equilibrium temperature. And, and you can see that, that in general, uh, you, you have this trend from cooler planets are pretty decent at moving heat around and, and hot planets are, are pretty dismal at it. So you see trends, which is cool. That's the beauty of statistics is that you can start, you can start teasing out these trends and trying to, to develop theories to explain these trends. Um, but you also get exceptions. Um, Okay, so that's, that's the trend, but here you go. Here's an exception that I put a little question mark down next to WASP-43b, um, again, a planet that you saw when I was describing uh, Dylan Keating's work. Uh, WASP-43b is weird. It's not that hot, and yet it's really, it's, it's quite dismal at transporting heat from day to night. Now, it could be that that's because we've misinterpreted its energy budget, because we've naively assumed that everything we measured in the near-infrared was thermal emission rather than reflected light. So this is, this is ongoing work that Dylan is gonna have to do. Um, but the point is WASP-43 kind of bucks the, the general trend we're seeing. Um, also, there's a bunch of planets stuck over on the left side of the plot, which are just kind of weird. I mean, these are planets where it looks like their albedo is zero. Um, it almost looks like their albedo is negative, which of course is impossible. But what that would mean is, is essentially these planets have some sort of internal energy source. So maybe these planets still have some 
remnant heat of formation, maybe they have slightly eccentric orbits. There's something that like, these planets are giving off at least as much heat as they receive from their star, which is just weird. It doesn't make sense. Okay, and so here are the lessons we've learned uh, thus far. So hot Jupiters are diverse. And the reason this is important is because hot Jupiters were supposed to be a monolithic class of planets. Um, people, you know, discovered hot Jupiters and they said, hey, great, you know, we found another hot Jupiter. And they, they kind of lumped them together. And then the idea was, we're gonna observe a couple of these. We'll figure out how, hot, how, hot, how a hot Jupiter works with this kind of naive assumption that all hot Jupiters are cut from the same cloth. And they're not, they're, they're extremely diverse. Um, they have different albedos, they have different emission spectra, they have different absorption spectra, they have different um, uh, heat transport, um, their clouds are in different places. I mean, they're just, they're, they're a really interesting group of planets. Um, and so if you now think about what that means for exoplanets in general, is that, you know, the, the diversity we see in the solar system is just the tip of the iceberg, right? So these planets, the planets we're discovering on other stars are just totally weird. Um, and and they, are, they are even more diverse than the things we've gotten used to studying in our solar system. Um, and of course, the, the follow-up to that is that our models are just woefully incomplete. And so, um, so that's good news for, for theorists. That means, there's, again, there's, there's job security. Okay, so what does the future hold for this? Uh, I'm gonna try and get through this pretty quick. Um, so the future is the James Webb Space Telescope to, to first order, to, to zeroth order and to first order. It's the James Webb Space Telescope. And so um, what can we do with the James Webb Space Telescope? Well, basically, as I intimated at the beginning of, of my talk, um, we can extend all the techniques that I've talked about, um, and then some, to um, planets like these. So these are artist's impressions, but these are real planets that we know exist. Um, so Proxima Centauri b, um, that one's actually tricky because it doesn't transit, we think. Um, but potentially some of the methods, the phase variations, could, could in principle be done for Proxima Sen. Um, the Trappist planets, okay, those are the ones where you have multiple planets in the habitable zone. Um, and then this recent uh, discovery from the MIRTH survey, LHS 1140b. Um, again, these are temperate planets, um, potentially habitable planets that orbit in the habitable zone of red dwarf stars. And so that's great. So we can try and measure transits. We can look, do transit spectroscopy. We can try and measure eclipses. We can even try and do phase curves for these planets. Um, the other big thing that's happening is, is TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And so TESS is going to find more uh, planetary systems um, that are like these, right? So TESS is going to find more potentially habitable planets. And that's going to be really exciting. But it turns out most of what TESS is going to find um, is going to be bright, um, bright stars with really interesting giant planets orbiting around it. So things that are kind of like Neptune, maybe sub-Neptune, but things that are kind of like uh, have thick gaseous envelopes. And it turns out there's going to be a lot of them. There's going to be thousands of them. And, uh, and there's no way in hell that the James Webb Space Telescope will have time to follow up all of these. And so we'll do really detailed studies on the, a few really choice targets. But there's going to be way too many of these, of these bright um, transiting exoplanets in order to, to actually study all of them with the James Webb Space Telescope. And so the, this was a problem that uh, Tom Green and I noted in a white paper um, in uh, a couple of years ago. And we basically pointed out that we're going, the exoplanet field is going from a target limited regime to a time limited regime. So right now we have very few targets. That's why the, you kept seeing the same names pop up over and over in my talk. Cause like there's really only a dozen planets that we can study in detail right now. Um, but in the future, we're gonna be in a time limited regime where we're gonna have thousands of planets that are just as awesome as the planets we currently have. And the problem is that we won't have enough telescope time to study them all. And moreover, it would be complete overkill to use the James Webb Space Telescope to study a lot of these. I mean, for a lot of these planets, um, you would do well with a much smaller uh, aperture. And so um, this is an idea that, that uh, some colleagues and I have, have, um, have tried to address uh, with a very small uh, mission, you know, a 75 centimeter primary mirror. Um, so this is the finesse mission and uh, I'll skip through, here we go. This is the key thing, right? Is that we would try and do transit spectroscopy for a thousand planets. Um, so basically all the best targets that TESS found we would just do transits like wholesale. We just go through every single one and do transit spectroscopy. And we would do something like 100 
um, eclipse measurements, thermal emission measurements, and phase measurements. So we'd be trying to, to take the, the philosophy of emission like test, which is trying to find lots and lots of planets, and then try and characterize lots and lots of planets. So it's a survey. Okay, so anyhow, this is, this is the, the crew of people working on this. So the PI is Mark Swain at, at JPL. And I think at this point, I'm going to stop and take questions. Thank you for your attention.